so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. Some pregnancies are accidental, some pregnancies are planned, and some pregnancies are so hard won, take so much effort and involve so much heartache and such a roller coaster of emotions and so much money and so many crushed and elevated hopes and so much science that when they finally happen, they truly feel like miracles. You're listening to No Filter. I'm Mia Friedman. And today you're going to hear a story about a miracle. Well, it's actually a few miracles because it's about a baby who was born to parents who tried so hard to have her over so many years and who faced such unimaginable hurdles and not just medical ones that if it wasn't a true story, you wouldn't believe it. It's a story about a couple who were together for 20 years and spent eight of them trying to get pregnant. A couple who did 15 rounds of IVF and had miscarriage after miscarriage and eventually, out of desperation and fierce hope and longing, turned to surrogacy. They found out that surrogacy laws in Australia are unspeakably complicated, so they looked overseas. They chose a country where surrogacy was widely available, so long as they got married first, and then they sent their embryo across the sea to Ukraine. Their surrogate became pregnant with their baby 14,000 kilometres away. The agency kept them updated because they didn't speak the same language as this woman they'd never met who was carrying their baby. And it was hard and painful and exhilarating and terrifying to wrap their head around. But it was the only way that they were going to be able to have a biological child. And it seemed to be working. Until a WhatsApp message arrives on an ordinary day which turns out to be not at all ordinary, because it says, your baby has been born and it's 11 weeks early. So they did what any parent would do in such circumstances. They raced to the airport to get to their little girl and they boarded the next flight headed for Ukraine. And then while they were changing flights in Dubai they got a message from the Department of Foreign Affairs. And they're like, I don't think you understand. Russia's just invaded Ukraine. Vladimir Putin has just addressed the Russian people moments ago, announcing what Putin called the start of a military special operation, in his words, to demilitarize Ukraine. This is the true story of how Jessica Van Noonten and her husband, Kevin Middleton, got their baby girl, Alba, back to Australia during a war against all the odds. You're not going to want to miss this one. Tell me about the day Alba was born. The day Alba was born is a very special day. So it was the 22nd of the 2nd, 22. So oh, wow. I was all geared up for that day because I knew it was a big energy portal, like meditation, manifesting. It's and a woo-woo day. It is. And you just be, need to be really careful what you wish for. <laughs> what were you doing on that day? I worked the morning. Um, You're a chef. I'm a chef, yeah. So I worked the morning and I got home and we'd just done 28 days alcohol-free. We were feeling fantastic. Kev was at work. We sort of had 11 weeks countdown until Elba's due date, which was the 11th of May. So we were sort of like I'd been to the gym at 6.30 in the morning, worked all day, home, cleaning, organising. Ordinary day. I'd actually had just done a Reiki session with my friend. We were practising on each other. So, And what happened in that session was bizarre. What happened? I saw Elba being born. Wow. Really weird. I thought it was a future. Yeah, I sort of pictured our surrogate mother uh, handing me the baby. And, yeah, and I also saw my husband on the plane with me coming home. And I'm like, he's not supposed to be coming home with me. That's strange because he was going to come home early. He did. And so, yeah, I sort of thought, oh, that was really interesting. And I debriefed Mm. with my friend saying, I actually saw, like, Elba being born. And she's like, wow, that's amazing. And then nothing of it. Walked off, (laughs) pottering around and then... I got a text message from Kevin saying, did you read the message? And I said, what message? And he's like, the baby's been born. I'm like, whose baby? He's like, our baby. And I said, what? what?" 
And I remember I was actually in the laundry. I just dropped to the floor and read the message. And the message said, hello, your baby's been born unexpectedly. She's alive for the moment. Oh. That's what it said. And what did you do? I went into a complete panic. I made phone calls I don't remember. I rang my mother and said, mum, you need to book me flights. I've got to get to Ukraine. And mum rang back saying, okay, I've got you tomorrow night. It's not soon enough, mum. <laughs> I need to get there now. <laughs> Were you immediately doing the maths in your head and going 11 weeks, 40 weeks is full term, she's 29 weeks? Yep. Oh, no. Yeah, it completely surprised me. Like I, I don't know, you always expect things could happen, but, yeah, I just had no, no idea. Had there been any issues through the pregnancy that gave you an indication that she might come early? So I'd had a friend who'd done surrogates in Ukraine before and when at 12 weeks our surrogate got put into hospital with um, Taurus of the uterus. So I got a text message saying, hello, your surrogate's in hospital with Taurus of the uterus. What's Taurus of the uterus? That's what I said. (laughs) And they said, you know, Taurus of the uterus. I had no idea. I ended up getting on to a Melbourne midwife who works with my clinic and she's like, oh, I've never heard of that. What I think it is in Australia, we'd call it an irritable uterus. We'd give you two Panadol, (sighs) send you home. Feed up for a couple of days. So a bit of cramping, yeah. maybe some spotting. Yeah. And so our surrogate mother was in hospital for two weeks for this. So I was sort of um, really reassured that they take things really seriously. And at 14 weeks, when I met with the surrogate on Zoom, I asked her, oh, are you still working? Because she's a barista, thinking that the baby will settle to the sound of frothing milk and <laughs> all these things. And uh, the agency's like, no, 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 she's not working. Her job's to grow your baby. And so I felt really reassured that, oh, Oh, good. Did and the agency sort of answer for her? Yes. In that call? They did it a lot of times. Could she speak English? No. And so you couldn't really have any direct communication with her, could you? No. Some surrogacy agencies, like surrogacy is huge in Ukraine. I think there's over 100 agencies. Yeah, so there's many agencies and every agency has their different things. We were told from the start that we would have no direct contact because, yeah, they were worried that like if she said, oh, I've got a sore back today, we'd panic. Mm. or they've had cases where surrogates exploit the intended parents. Mm. So I sort of, it was really hard for me, but I sort of accepted, okay, this is what it is. Mm. I can't talk to her. So we had regular Zoom meetings. On the Sunday evening, we got a text message saying, hello, your surrogate mother's in hospital with back pain. And we were sitting on the couch, I remember, and I sort of said to Kev, back pain. What pregnant woman doesn't get back pain? And we sort of had a bit of a giggle and thinking of what my friend told me, that she'll be hospitalised two or three times before the end of the pregnancy. Do not worry. So I wasn't worried at all. Mm. I was a little bit anxious. So I got the ultrasound report and I rang my midwife and said, can you look at this? And she wasn't in. She said, I'll call you tomorrow. And then when she called me the next day, I'm like, it's too late. Baby's here. (laughs) Oh, wow. So the back pain was labor. Yeah. And I had, yeah, we didn't know. We, yeah, we didn't know. So Alba's come 11 weeks early. You're scrambling to get on a plane. Had you been aware of the threat of Russia and war, was that on your mind? It was on my mind. For years there's been tanks on the borders, like years. Like I'm part of a um, Ukrainian surrogacy support group and so they're always talking about, yeah. And in the lead up I wasn't watching news. I was just not available for that. I wasn't listening. Like, mm. And I'd sort of said, oh, they closed the airspace, I'm going in. Like I had no real idea of what was happening. Had but, you thought about that and talked about it yeah, with Kevin? Yeah, I'm like, I'm going. Yeah, and my mum was always going to come with me early and she said, well, I probably can't come if there's, yeah. But, a war? Yeah. So I was like, I'm just going to go. But I blocked it out. I'm just not listening to that. I'm not available for it. Like, we've come this far. <laughs> As if a war is going to stop me from getting to my baby. <laughs> I was literally saying things like that. Now I look at myself thinking, oh, my goodness. But also, Ukrainian people, like, if you asked any of them, they'd say there is no war. There's no war. It's the Western media. This is before the before, actual war yep. because now it's, you know, fairly well documented proof that there is a war. But yeah. before, what, they were in denial or they just didn't want to no, damage they, the economy? I don't think they, I really don't think they thought it was going to happen because I yeah. heard it from different sources. Like I would ask friends, what's your agency saying or what's your lawyer saying? And they're like, oh, it's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. So you got on a plane the next day? Yeah. <laughs> so the next day we got on a plane and at 10.30 at night, And we got a phone call 
I can't remember who it was from, but they're like, oh, do you really think you should go? Like there is a threat of war. Like When you say you got a phone call, like what was the agency saying? So Alba was born. How much did you know about her condition? Because 11 weeks is really early. We didn't know much. So at that stage when we got on the plane, all we were told that she was in the maternity house, which I assumed had a NICU in it. Mm. Um, An ICU for newborns, yeah, yeah. yeah. We were told that she was stable. You got a message saying something like her condition is difficult but stable. Yeah, and they're doing everything they possibly can, mm-hmm. and that's what, what that was the message. And and they were. So we got on the plane and we're flying to Dubai, and we were so exhausted we slept. And I think about four hours to go, we woke up and we're like, "Oh my gosh, it's like ten o'clock now. We've got four hours, and then we're in Dubai, and then we've got this, that, this. We're going to be holding Elba in like twelve hours." And so our fear turned into excitement. Mm. We were looking at the two photos we had going, oh, I just can't wait to be. What did she look like in those photos? She looked big. Did she? Yeah. We thought she looked quite big. What did she weigh when she was born? She weighed 1,450 grams. Which that's is, not big. I think it is, oh, it is for a preemie. I suppose for a baby that's 11 weeks <laughs> yeah. preemie. Wow. But um, we were like, oh, she looks really big. She looks, yeah, she looked really like coloured, mm. like she looked good colour. And so we just kept on looking at those two photos and I actually had my Wi-Fi on the plane because I was just waiting for updates and we got a picture, but I couldn't see it. (laughs) And so it was just torture. But um, we did get a message on the the flight. I can't exactly remember what it said, but um, we didn't know anything about Alba's condition until we landed in Warsaw. So it must have been a couple of days after she was born. You arrived in Dubai and what happened then? So we got a phone call from the Australian government saying, where are you going? And we said, oh, we're going to Odessa. And they're like, how did they have your number? Uh, My mother, I think. Yeah. (laughs) I think mum registered me with some travel thing. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually because DFAT helped us a lot. Mm. Yeah. So we got a phone call saying, what are you doing? And we said, we're going to Odessa. And they're like, no, you're not today. And I'm like, yeah, Kev. Go check the flight board. Is, are we still on there? <laughs> and he comes like, yeah, yeah, we're still on there. We're going in like an hour and a half. And they're like, I don't think you understand. Russia's just invaded Ukraine. Oh, jeez. And we were like, what? What do you mean? What do we do? And so we sort of contacted an agency in Australia who had helped us and the agency in Ukraine saying, well, what do we do? And the agency in Ukraine and also Australia said, get yourselves to Poland. Because... We could possibly cross the border in Poland and make it down to Elba. So all flights in and out of Ukraine were cancelled, airspace, war. And we were one of the first or second people to get in that line. And when we were in the line, we got a message from Emirates saying our flight had been cancelled. And then with that, like Ukrainian families trying to get home were behind us in the line. That was the Mm. first start of like the the realisation of what was happening. Like these families have been on holidays. They're trying to get home. Was this all in Dubai? Yeah. Like what was the mood? It was a bit frantic. Yeah, it was frantic. So and when we, they tried to send us to Moscow <laughs> and we're like, do you not understand that like we can't go to Moscow? <laughs> yeah, not not a good place to go. <laughs> no. So you eventually got to Warsaw. Yep. And then how did you get to her? So when we got to Warsaw, we went to a hotel and then we were just waiting to hear from the agency. We got a video message and that's when we realised our elbow was unwell. You say you realised, but when you spoke to doctors and I imagine you looked online, a baby that's born 11 weeks premature, a lot of issues. Did that come as a surprise? I didn't Google it. Because we did so much IVF, I knew everything about IVF. I knew everything. I wrote my own cycles. I questioned doctors. I knew everything. I was Mm. obsessed. But since Elba's been born, I can't. I've not Googled one premature. I understand. Baby thing. I thought we were going to get a small baby. Mm. I didn't realise the risks associated with a baby born 11 weeks early. So what did you learn when you were in Warsaw waiting to get to her? We got a video message from the head doctor of the NICU and our agency translator and they sort of said that um, Elba's 11 weeks premature. She has three major issues. She has a brain bleed. She has undeveloped intestines. And both of her lungs are collapsed. Oh. And I just remember, like, I actually said to him, stop it. I can't, I can't listen anymore. And he watched it. And then the next morning I watched it and he's like, I can't listen anymore. Turn it off. And that's when it sort of hit, would we be bringing her home at all? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. So that was, yeah. When you were in Warsaw, I imagine 
the visceral need to be with her and to get to her. Was that like anything you'd ever experienced? Those two weeks we were away from Elba were probably the hardest two weeks of my life. And also my husband, he's not very emotional, but it was really hard. Like we just sat in our hotel rooms just watching war news, waiting for updates. The culture in Australia and the culture in Ukraine is very different. Everything's different. In what way? In Ukraine, people don't question doctors. I'm not sure if communication is a little bit less because they trust, but I was beside myself and I was like, I need an update, I need an update, I need an update. And we didn't get very regular updates. Were there other intended parents in the same situation as you from Australia? Full-term babies, yeah, there were. At that stage, I think there was three. So did you guys have a WhatsApp group and were you sharing information? Was the government saying, here's what you should do? We were in a WhatsApp group, but no one really wanted to talk to me because I'd spoken to the media. And I think some people are very secretive about surrogacy. I've always been very open about it. One of the first books I bought for Elba is called Grown in Another Garden. Like she's going to read that book. She's always going to know. I think lots of people are quite secretive about it. And like I'd had some of these couples, with all due respect to them, they just sort of said, look, we don't want to talk. Yeah, we don't want us to be mentioned. And I totally get Mm. that. So we didn't really have a great communication with a group because of that. But the government, DFAT was amazing. They called every day. (laughs) Where are you? What are you doing? And you said we're going in. Yeah. What did they say? Don't go. Our advice is to strongly not There's advise a war. you to go. If you go, you don't have any support. But you went. Yeah. How did you get there? So we couldn't cross in Poland. So we woke up one morning. I'm like, we've got to get closer. So we flew to Bucharest, stayed there for two nights. We booked one and then the agency said, no, it's still not safe. So we stayed another night. And then woke up and we're like, we need to get closer. The Moldovian airspace was closed, so we couldn't eight hour bus from Romania to Moldova. And then we checked into a hotel there and we just waited. And then one day the agency said, okay, you can come now. So then we had to change some money because we had to, the deal is you pay the surrogate in euros. In cash. In cash. So we had euros strapped to our tummies. We were ready to go. We were so excited but so nervous. And I wasn't thinking about the war. I was just thinking about Elba. Mm. It didn't, like a friend of mine texted me saying, just sending you love for today. I hope you're okay. Like just be prepared. You're going to see some pretty confronting things. And it wasn't until I read her message, I'm like, what am I going to see that's confronting? I looked out the window and there's tents, rows of tents, like just near the border where the refugees are staying. And then when we actually got in, like there's a little girl sitting on her suitcase waving goodbye to her dad. Who's going off to fight in the war because he has to. And that was probably when it really hit home that, what are we doing? Mm. But we didn't have a choice. There was no choice. It felt like a movie. Like it really felt like we were in a movie. Were there like bombs going off and tanks and planes overhead? Like What is a modern war zone like? Well, that's what I was expecting. Like I was sort of thinking, are we even going to make it to the city? Are we going to make the drive to the safe zone? Mm. Are we going to see planes? So on the way in, our driver wouldn't take us any further. He was supposed to take us the whole way, but he wouldn't because um, it was about a three-day line to get out. So they organised another car, but the driver couldn't wait in the traffic. So he walked five kilometres to us. So people were really going out of their way to help you and support you to get to your baby. They were. After the break, Jess tells us about the very first time she saw her baby girl and the harrowing, incredible story of how they got her out of Ukraine and to London. And you better have your tissues ready. Tell me about the first time you saw Alba. It was Incredible. We've got videos and our hands are shaking. We got to the town and we got to our accommodation. We're like, right, we need to go see Alba. We need to go see Alba. And the agency took us and they were brilliant. Took us to the pharmacy, got our PPE and then we walked in. The doctor of the day was just beautiful and she sort of took us in and we ran over to her and then they're like, no, 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 wash your hands, wash your hands. When you were actually in the town, was it a normal hospital? Did things seem normal in the streets? No, definitely not. So on the way into the city, there were lots of bollards on the road. You could see the army practising in their tanks and camouflage things. and Soldiers everywhere. Soldiers everywhere. And we were checked about oh, 10 or 12 times for ID on the way in. And they checked the ID, look all through the car, ask us, are we journalists? (laughs) Why else would you be coming in? And we would just hold up the photo of Elba and we're like, this. Did people soften their 
Yeah, no. they did a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, they did a little bit. The city itself was like these bollards were everywhere. So you had to drive really slowly and it was quiet. We saw one man in the middle of the road with a big sign around his neck and we sort of said, oh, what's that about? And the lady said, oh, there's no alcohol in <laughs> in a war zone. So he's saying, please give me alcohol. Oh, wow. um, yeah, so their whole lives had changed. So everything was closed. There mm. were only pharmacies and supermarkets open, no restaurants, no cafes. So you're all gowned up, yeah. you're walking in. What did you see? Uh, we saw a tiny little baby in the corner on a ventilator just laying there. And I said, oh, I'm sorry it took me so long. Yeah, and my husband just said, hello, baby. <laughs> it was, yeah, really, really special. Yeah. Your little girl. Yeah, who we'd been trying for for so long, seven years. And then, yeah, just to see her like that was beautiful but heartbreaking. Could you touch her? Yeah, we could touch her and hold her head. And I don't think she opened her eyes that day. But then we had to leave because there's a curfew. Oh, that must have been hard. Yeah. And how long did that go for? The Uh, back and forth and visiting her like that? So we were there for three weeks. Yeah, so we'd go every day. They said we could only have 15 to 20 minutes, but we pushed it every day (laughs) until someone sort of asked us to go. But they never asked, to be honest. We sort of just, we stayed for as long as we could every day. Did you meet the surrogate? I did. Yeah, that was probably, uh, except for meeting Elba, the highlight. So, yeah, she was just beautiful. And it was really special for both of us to meet because, yeah, just I couldn't have left without seeing her. Mm. How did you communicate? Like what did you say? We had a translator but we just cuddled, yeah, and cried. (laughs) Mm. And now we're actually communicating on Instagram. So, yeah. Did she have other children? How did she feel about leaving Alba? She has two children of her own who she was separated from at the time. They were in Kirsten, which was really hard for us to hear. Her children did make it to her and they are still in Ukraine. They won't leave Lots of people won't leave. They don't want to leave their husbands. She mm. doesn't want her children to leave their father. So and is he fighting in the war? I think so. I believe so, yeah. Mm. So they've moved up north where it's safer and she says they'll stay there until after the winter. Tell me about choosing her and deciding on surrogacy. You and Kevin had tried for a long time to have yeah. a baby. You had many attempts at IVF and miscarriages. When did the idea of surrogacy come about? Surrogacy was mentioned to us a few times early on and I was just, no, not having a bar of it, no, not interested, like I can do this. And then we would come so close and then we'd try again. It's like an addiction, IVF, I think. You get so close and then you just do a little bit again and if you change this and you change that, surely you'll get a bit closer. It's the ultimate gamble, isn't it? It is. And like the chances of it working are like, I think, 30%. You wouldn't go into a lottery or anything knowing the chances were so low, but um, it's just a dream to become parents. So surrogacy really hit home for us with my third fertility specialist, and he's known to be very straight. (laughs) And he said, I'm not transferring any more embryos. So it wasn't the fertilization that was a problem. It was that you just couldn't carry a baby to term. Yeah. Because I've done so much IVF, my endometrial lining is, yeah, it won't hold a baby. So when you looked at surrogacy, what were your options? Well, first of all, you think of Australia, and this is the really interesting thing. Surrogacy laws in Australia are really hard and they need to change. It's been made illegal in Australia, hasn't it? You can't pay anyone for it. It has to be altruistic. So someone has to do it from the goodness of their heart. Like egg donation. Yeah, with no Mm. compensation. You can't even put a deposit in their bank account or buy them a car. It's just you can go to jail for it. Mm -hmm. And surrogacy laws also in Australia, are different with every state and territory. So my sister, who lives in Tasmania, she couldn't be my surrogate because I would have to live in Tasmania. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's just in particularly the Tasmanian rules. And is it legal in the state that you live in, which is Victoria, to use an overseas surrogate? Because I believe in New South Wales it's It's not not legal anymore. Yeah, it is legal. In Victoria it is. Yes. So it's I think like they're very different laws, aren't they, yeah, depending on what state laws. you live in. Yeah. And I can't remember what state it is, but only just recently let gay men use a surrogate. Yeah, it's just really, really It's terrible. really inconsistent across, yeah. across the country. And Australia is hard. Like I've got a friend who's been trying for three years to find an altruistic surrogate. She actually had transplant rejection 
And so she's about to go on dialysis. And she's been looking for three years with great distress. Like she's had trauma therapy and it's terrible for her. And it's just every day that goes on is a day that she might not get to be a mum. When you start thinking about surrogacy, do you talk to an agency here? Because there's different countries that you can do surrogacy in. Yeah. There. How do you decide? How do you navigate that? Well, we went to a conference run by Sam Everingham from Growing Families Australia. He does surrogacy conferences. So me and my mum went along to that and we sort of learned about Australian surrogacy. We learned about Mexico, America, Canada. There's a few other countries, Georgia, Greece, Ukraine. And we chose Ukraine because they really look after their surrogates. So the surrogates are treated like princesses. They get a weekly wage and then they get a lump sum at the end. And also it's very legal. So with commercial surrogacy, it's a contract. So you have an agency and the intended parents and the surrogate are both protected. So you felt that it was going to be the most ethical way to do it. Because what are some of the ethical concerns around surrogacy, things that you wanted to avoid? Well, lots of people think that it's rich women taking advantage of people. And it's certainly not. Like I asked our surrogate, why is she doing it? And she said, because I can. And so we were able to change her life and she was able to change ours. Like women offer this gift and mm-hmm. then they get something back in return. We're the first people on the birth certificate. Mm. I mean, surrogacy is the most exhausting, terrifying, financially draining thing ever. But How much did it cost all up, do you think? Including our IVF costs or? So the no, surrogacy, just the surrogacy process. Our agency was about 40,000 euros. Mm. How many, like roughly Probably dollars? Probably $70,000. Mm-hmm. But then you've got all your legal fees. So you need to get all documents apostled here. You need to send power of attorney. You need to send wedding certificates. You need to send all these things. Well, let's talk about wedding certificates for a minute because <laughs> you and Kevin had been together for 20 years. Yes. Marriage wasn't on your mind. It was on mine. But he just wasn't interested. He was. He's just. He like, just was keeping his options open. Yeah, that's what he says. He's <laughs> waiting to find the right person. <laughs> But why did you have to get married? So in Ukraine, they only accept married heterosexual couples. So okay. we had a very rushed wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and nine months later on the day, we had a baby, which is quite So they premature. wouldn't even engage with you until you were married? No, they were actually quite good. So they engaged with us. We were able to ship our embryos. We just couldn't be matched with a surrogate until we were married and they had our marriage difficult. Wow. Yeah, that delayed things and that was really hard, like waiting. So people who aren't married or who are maybe married in same-sex relationships or unmarried in same-sex relationships or single, where can they go to use surrogates? America. I know a few um, gay couples that have gone to Cancun in Mexico. Yep. But the legal system is a little bit different. Georgia used to be unmarried, but I think they're pushing towards married now. And so... The decision was made to move Alba. How did you make any decisions in that time? Like who was your North Star of advice that you listened to? We were so lucky. Like first, my two good friends set up our Instagram page and we got people from all over the world helping. Like we had a lovely lady from Geneva who worked for the Global Fund who volunteered her time. She heard our story and she just wanted to help. We had a doctor from Queensland who helped uh, move Elba, helped organise all that. And we had a doctor from Melbourne who is our guardian angel. She saved Elba's life. How did she do that from all the way in Melbourne? So every day we would send her pictures of the machines of Elba and she'd sort of explain to us what the machines mean, how Elba looks, and she'd also ask questions for us to ask. And then she helped facilitate the moves. And then she also got us accepted into Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. So so you got to London, you got out of there. The time in hospital was really hard in Ukraine. Parents don't really visit, as I was talking about earlier, like people just trust the doctors and mm. we didn't often see other parents there and it was very strange for them to see parents there, especially Kev. Yeah, mm, and so, Not a lot of engaged dads. Well, I guess also in this instance they were off fighting wars. They were, and we're, we are so grateful for what they did for yeah. Elba in Ukraine, like so grateful. They saved her life. But I wonder if she was born here, what, if we would have faced the same issues, if the same things would have mm. happened, if, yeah. You never know. We won't know, and that's, yeah. So we are very grateful for the doctors and the nurses, but the communication was very hard. Mm. They wouldn't communicate with my doctor in Melbourne. 
they wouldn't really communicate with me. And then one day we went in and we, they said, oh, you can't stay long today because the child's having an operation. Next, Your child? No, next mm-hmm. to her. And we said, okay, see you tomorrow. And I said, no, no, sit down. You're going tomorrow. And we're like, where are we going? <laughs> what? I said, what do you mean? Yesterday you said if we move her, she'll die. Today you're saying we can go? So I don't know why. I don't know what happened. Um, where did you move her to? Moldova. Moldova. So we went with two ambulances. Kevin and I were waiting downstairs in Ukraine thinking, oh, yep, the humidity crib will come down in a minute. But no, she came down bundled in all these blankets. Just like a baby, full-term yeah. baby. Yeah. I was like, oh, my goodness, they're hand-carrying her. But I'm so grateful they did because our trip from the border to Moldova Hospital, they had her in a humidity crib, but she wasn't strapped in. And, like, I was watching her shake around like a rag doll. It was really, really awful. That must have been so distressing. It was really distressing. And then when we got to Moldova, they said, oh, your baby's going to die. The trip was really, yeah, traumatic. When did you feel things might be okay? When we got to London. How long after she was born was this? Six weeks. So she spent five weeks in Ukraine. We spent three. And then, yeah, she spent a week and a half in Moldova and then we arrived in London. How long were you in London for? Eleven weeks. Just this all sounds very expensive. Yes. (laughs) Who paid for all of this? We were really, really lucky that my friends set up a a My Cause page and so we got public donations. I think... They raised $78,000. I still haven't read the messages yet. I couldn't read Mm. them when we were overseas because I was just so emotional by how generous people were. Mm. Like people we knew, people we didn't know. So that's how we paid for the flights, Elvis Medivac. Yeah, but a lot of it's been out of our pockets as well. So Kevin had to go back to work because you'd been away for 11 weeks. Yep, so he went home. That must have been quite heartbreaking for you and him. We were ready. Oh. <laughs> no, a little bit. You're like, Kevin, leave, please. <laughs> We'd spent 11 weeks together okay. in a war zone okay. and we were sort of at the stage where it's, okay, bye. But then as soon as he left, I was a mess. Like oh. I, it was the first time things started to hit me and I think it's because yeah. kevy has been there with me since day one. He's the only one who knew what it was like every day yeah. in Ukraine, like when the bomb alarms went off. Like he, he felt that with me. He... Yeah. What would happen when the bomb alarms went off? So we got a app on our phone and so an alarm would go off when there was a threat. That's an app no one wants to ever have to install. No, it would flash and you'd have to go to your safe place, which is a basement, but we didn't have a basement. So we went to our laundry, which was two walls away from the windows. Where you were staying. And yeah. Oh so we God. spent a lot of time in our laundries. We had the laptops in there and quite often you would hear crashes. And I would text the agency saying, what was that? And they'd say, don't worry, that's that's good. That's our army getting rid of a Russian drone. That's this, that's that. So we were on the Black Sea, our accommodation. And one particular morning, the neighbours had had a party and we were so tired and I think it was a third alarm and we looked at each other and went, shh, shh, just go back to sleep. <laughs> and then we felt the biggest crash you've ever felt in your life. And what was it? It like was a bomb. A bomb? Yeah, it was a shelling. Yeah, on the outskirts of the town. And hospitals were being shelled as well, weren't they? They were, and that was the most terrifying thing. Like our agency had said to us, hospital's safe, it's a no-go zone, there's a thing on the roof. And so we were like, yep, hospital is safe. And then you saw what happened in Mariupol. Mm. And that was probably the most scariest time because, oh, yeah. one of them, we would just sit in the cupboard and just pray, God, keep up with safe, God, keep up with safe, God, keep up with safe. And on this particular morning when we felt it, we we're like, we need to pack. Yeah. So we packed passports. If we have to go all of a sudden, we have to go, what are we taking? And so we had that bag then packed by the door so we were ready to go and we needed to go. Like when the bomb alarms went off, like over the city, like you could hear it outside but you could also hear it on your phone. And one particular day we were out doing grocery shopping and it went off and people were just walking like normal. Yeah, people were just carrying on with their days, walking with these threat of bomb alarms going off. But Kevin and I were like running to the closest basement we could find. Mm. When you're in London and you were out of imminent danger and it looked like Alba was out of imminent danger, although having said that, she had four operations, didn't she, when you were in London. How did your fight or flight response that you'd been in this high level of absolute Mm. alert for so many months at this point, how did you climb down from that? I don't think I have. Mm. I still think we're in that fight or flight. Like 
I sort of thought when we got out of Ukraine, it would be okay. But then in Moldova, we every time we heard a crash or a bang, we jumped, we panicked, we couldn't understand. We were just an hour away from the border mm. and people were going to school. They were having fun. Restaurants were open, cafes were open. It's like in London, it still didn't really, we still were sort of up there because you yeah, were worried about Elba's medical condition. And I sort of keep saying to myself, when life goes back to normal, mm. I think I will really, yeah, it'll hit. But life's never going to go back to normal. <laughs> I do have those days though. So the other day, a couple of days ago, I had a particularly bad day. and I just couldn't stop crying. It does come up. Yeah. I'm sure. And I also carry a lot of guilt. Why? That I put Elba through that. It was my choice. To bring her into the world? Yeah, I chose Ukraine. Yeah, I do carry a lot of guilt. So I guess I haven't really accepted everything yet. That means you're a real mum. <laughs> I know, this mum guilt is, I have heard of that. <laughs> it's like your guilt is, I've brought my daughter into the world in a war zone. It's degrees of guilt, isn't mm. it? I think you're fairly up there high on the leaderboard. <laughs> I know. But London was, like the Great Ormond Street Hospital was amazing. Like, it's where the royals' babies are born, I'm, aren't they? Uh, isn't it? In I the Lindo Wing. It's <laughs> a very mean, fancy hospital, I think. It is, and it was just like our first day there. We had the play therapist come around. We had this, we had that. The we play had, therapist. Yeah, <laughs> we had, yeah, physios. When was it decided that Alba was able to take the flight home to Australia? So we had, like, again, an army of people helping us, the doctors and especially the doctor from Melbourne and the social worker at London. So they set up a big meeting with, like, all the doctors involved the lovely social worker, Wendy, said, normally I do these invites and no one comes. I think they invited 18 people and everyone RSVP'd <laughs> for Elba. And so they just narrowed it down to just the key players. And so this team of seven amazing individuals decided that when Elba could come home, they changed the ballpark. They told me three kilos and they changed it to four, which was devastating for us to hear because mm. Kev had come home thinking we we're only going to be a few weeks. And then next minute it's like, no, we're going to be longer. We need another kilo. I know. So I was like feeding her like uh, foie gras, <laughs> <laughs> force feeding. No, I wasn't. But um, my mum came over and we were in an Airbnb, not in London, <laughs> outside of London. It's so expensive. Yeah, so we had to wait. and But she was home with you at that stage. Yeah. She's six months now. Yes. And what is she doing? The things a three-month-old would do. Yeah. So she's found her hands. Because she's three months corrected. Three months corrected. So she's laughing and smiling and she's found her hands and they're always in her mouth knocking a dummy out. <laughs> yeah, with the physio and the OT, she's hitting all the goals that they want her to. So they came over. The Royal Children's helped us for the first six weeks. And so they sort of came over and they're like, are you playing with her? And I'm like, no, I'm just feeding her, sleeping. <laughs> and they go, okay, you need to start playing with her. Do this, do that. And then they came back two weeks later and they're like, oh, fantastic. So she's hitting toys, grabbing toys. Yeah. Wow. And so we've just been transferred to like a, a private physio, a local physio. And we had our first assessment the other day and Elba screamed the whole time. But she sort of assured me that it's, we're in a long journey together. We'll probably be seeing her for seven years. Yeah. And if the first session she screams, she screams. But she also gave me a lot of hope with Elba's brains. She says that she has children who come in with parts of their brain removed from epilepsy. And she's able to teach those children to do things and, yeah, and it's quite amazing. She sort of said that Elba's brain, whilst it is damaged in one part, her left-hand side can learn how to do what the right-hand side does oh, and wow. her right-hand side can learn to do what the left-hand side does. So early intervention is going to be the key and we're going to put in everything we can. Like they sort of explained it, it's like a garden. Her brain can grow and weeds will go over to one side and weeds will go over to other sides and she'll trim bits off she doesn't need and bits will grow here and bits will grow there and she'll just develop out of her own way. Yeah, and I sort of said to the physio, oh, I'm just worried she's six months old. We've only got 18 months till her brain. And she's like, no, 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 she's three months old. She's got more than that. She's got 21 months 21 until months what happens at two years? It's sort of when the brain sort of stopped. I'm not sure, to be honest. but I So think some of that fast-moving development yeah, stops, stops or slows down. Yeah, so she was sort of really positive. She's like, I can do all these things with Elba. We can do this, we mm. can do that. She's like, you couldn't have got her here any earlier. From the start of trying to have a baby through the IVF, through the miscarriages, through the surrogacy, through everything you went through in Ukraine and then getting her home, when you thought about the end point, 
what was it? Was it walking through the door into your house? Because I remember I had miscarriages and then I was told to visualize the outcome I wanted. And for me, it was walking into my house with the baby in the capsule. What was it for you that you'd sort of held on as that's when I'll relax? I think it was the photo that I got of Kev leaving the hospital, like leaving the hospital with her in the capsule to the car, that one. Yeah. I've seen every therapist under the sun, (laughs) but Mm. I finally got onto a really different sort of therapist a couple of years ago, a psychotherapist, but also hypnotherapist, Reiki master. So we tried lots of alternate things. In the two-week wait from when Elba was transferred to when we found out she was pregnant, I would just be like probably 100 times a day, it's my turn to hear yes. It's my turn to hear yes. It's my turn to hear yes. Yes, I will get a positive result. Yes, we will have a healthy pregnancy. Yes, we will bring this baby home. And whenever my mind wandered, I would go back to that. It's my turn to hear yes. Oh, I love that. It's really, yeah. It's my turn to hear yes. It is, yeah, and that's what I would just say to myself. Because did good news start to almost shock you? Yeah. Because it was blow after blow after yeah. blow. And I would have panic attacks. The night of the blood test, I didn't have a panic attack. The six-week scan, I did. The 12-week scan, I did. I didn't get to hear Elva's heart beat until she was about 18 weeks. Mm. Again, the communication is just very different. What's motherhood like now that you're not in a war zone? <laughs> She's not hooked up to ventilators. It's pretty amazing. I had my first mother's group yesterday and they they were sort of saying how hard it is and I <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I find this part really, I can't say easy. Like, well, yes, we have our days, but like I hated being in the hospital. I dreaded the nights at hospital. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just love being home with her. I love doing things with her. Not that we've done much. We have a lot of medical appointments. But um, at the mother's group yesterday, the maternal health nurse sort of said, there's two types of people. One person will come in and say, oh, yeah, it was a great night. I got up twice last night. And then the next person comes in going, oh, I got up twice last night. I'm the, I got up twice last night. <laughs> and not because there was a bomb going no, off. No, not because there was a bomb going yeah. off. Or, but motherhood, I'm constantly scared. Yeah, like when we met with our neonatologist last week, she sort of reminded me that Alba had a very rough start. She was malnourished and on a ventilator for so long. We don't know what the future holds. So, I, yeah, I don't lie. I'm very anxious. Mm. I'm very anxious. But um, I'm also just so happy. And it's funny, I had my old bosses come over the other night and they're like, you're so relaxed. Like, we didn't think you'd be like this. (laughs) You're just like, it's amazing what happens when you don't have to shelter in your laundry. I know, I know. And I think that's, I'm just so grateful that we are home and we are in yeah. this country. And it was so hard leaving Ukraine. Like it was really hard leaving the doctors and the nurses and our surrogate because mm. they can't leave because and you of don't their medical procession. What, what their future. We don't know what's going to happen. You just don't know. I mean, you can hope and pray that this war ends, but how's it going to end? So glad that you're home and that Alba's home and that Kevin's made an honest woman of you. (laughs) You've made an honest man out of Kevin. (laughs) I know. I'm very lucky. All those funny things. No, I'm just thrilled and uh, I can't wait to hear how things go with Alba. Thank you. You deserve every smile and bit of joy. Oh, thank you so much. You can read more about Alba's story on mamamia.com.au and we will put a link in the show notes. No Filter is produced by Gia Moylan. The executive producer is Eliza Ratliff. And if you enjoy No Filter and all the work we do here at Mamma Mia, consider becoming a paid Mamma Mia subscriber and supporting women's media. There's a link in our show notes to upgrade to a paid subscriber. I'm Mia Friedman. Thanks for having me in your ears.